en México este, pues la libertad de expresión está muy, muy cabrona. No es fácil ser periodista. Between January and July, 10,000 people have been murdered in Mexico by the drug cartels. I hope that my, my, my work can help to the people to understand what is happening. And if the people understand what is happening, the people can change the things. In 2010, Mexican journalist Annabel Hernandez exposed intricate connections between cartels, the government, and the DEA. This shook the powers in Mexico. But what they did to Hernandez changed the course of her life forever. Here are 10 times journalists mess with the wrong cartels. Number 10. Javier Valdez Cárdenas. No soy periodista del silencio. Quiero seguir viviendo, quiero seguir respirando. Morir sería dejar de, de escribir. May 15th, 2017. Javier was shot 12 times by an unidentified gunman in Culiacán, Sinaloa. His death brought an end to decades of trying to expose the cartel and all its operations. But the real question was, how did it happen? Cardenas was born on April 14, 1967, in the same city where he was killed. As a teenager, he was greeted with all the violence in the area. Cocaine, death, kidnapping, human trafficking, you name it. But unlike almost every other teenager who indulged in these crimes to earn a living, Cardenas joined the good side to bring him down. He got a degree in sociology from the Autonomous University of Sinaloa, and then got a job as a reporter for the national TV station Canal 3. And that's when things started getting interesting. Now, he worked with a handful of TV stations throughout the 90s, but Cardenas wasn't satisfied with their level of competence when it came to addressing the affairs of criminal organizations. And don't get us wrong, we're not saying they were corrupt. I'm saying they were playing it safe, maybe too safe for Cardenas. So he started his own newspaper publication called Periodoce. Periodoce was a blessing and a curse for Cardenas. Because on one hand, he was able to uncover some of the deepest and dirtiest reports in organized crime. But on the other, he was branded with a huge target on his back. Regardless of that, Javier wasn't willing to stop exposing him. He would publish many books on drug trafficking, some gaining international recognition. One that really stood out was Miss Narco, which detailed the lives of the girlfriends and wives of drug lords, along with the disgusting levels of debauchery some of these women faced against their will. And to put into context just how dangerous things were for Cárdenas back then, the former Mexican president Felipe Calderón had just resumed office, and he dispatched around 6,000 Mexican army soldiers to Michoacán and Sinaloa. Their aim? Wiping out corruption. Now this period was by far one of the most intense in Mexico's fight against drug trafficking. The streets were filled with blood, dead bodies, and bullets everywhere. More than 14,500 people died in the span of about three years. Yet with no guns or bodyguards, Javier kept digging into the Sinaloa cartel until they finally attacked. September 2009, unidentified assailants hurled a grenade in the Rio Doce's facilities, causing substantial damage to that building. Thankfully, no one was injured, but the attack came as a result of a key publishing Javier made less than 24 hours before. The publication was titled, Hitman, Confession of an Assassin in Ciudad Juarez. And believe us when we say that this publication caused a huge stir in public opinion. Remarkably, he continued to expose these individuals, and to his surprise, there were no fresh attacks or death threats on his life or family until he once again provoked the Sinaloa cartel. In 2011, Javier was given the International Press Freedom Award by the Committee to Protect Journalists in New York. In that acceptance speech, he condemned the violence in Mexico, blaming both the citizens and the government for playing a role in driving that war forward. His speech obviously pissed off the Mexican government, but it also pissed off, that's right, the Sinaloa cartel. And it meant one thing, and one thing only. Javier needed to go. May 15th, 2017. 
Javier was shot mercilessly 12 times by an unidentified gunman around noon, just a few blocks away from his office in Culiacan, Sinaloa. The Mexican authorities couldn't link anyone to the murder. No suspects, no leads, nothing. His murder was condemned by the U.S. Embassy in Mexico, the United Nations, and the European Union. He left behind his wife, Griselda Triana, who was also a journalist, along with their little daughter. And if you're asking what happened to his publication, it didn't die along with him. It was continued by another news outlet, Forbidden Stories, and the German newspaper Zeit Online. So it looks as though his legacy lives on. Number 9. Miguel Angel Villagomez Valle October 9, 2008, Miguel Valle was kidnapped on his way home from work after dropping off two colleagues. While you might anticipate what happened next, the events leading up to that incident will undoubtedly leave you shocked. Born in 1979, Villa Gomez was raised in the Mexican state of Guerrero. After getting his formal education, he moved to the coastal city of Lazaro Cárdenas, Michoacán, where he got his first job as a local newspaper journalist. Now, this move would be both a blessing and a curse. Let us explain why. Michoacán is one of the most violent states in Mexico, with regular confrontations between the Sinaloa cartel, the Zetas, and the La Familia crime organization. It's not uncommon for journalists to disappear, be abducted, or murdered due to the presence of these syndicates, making his move there more or less a death wish. However, there was a reason he came here. He founded and published his own newspaper, La Noticia de Michoacán. The outlet would start with simple machinery and three computers, reporting about sports, politics, and every other thing apart from the dealings of notorious crime syndicates. However, when the violence increased and everyone was turning to his newspaper for the best updates, Miguel was forced to dive deep into their operations. But he didn't delegate the work to any random worker. He decided to write about the big stories himself. He worked as the writer, editor, and publisher of his own newspaper. This made La Noticia de Michoacán have the largest circulation in Mexico's West Port, with 2,500 copies sold daily. It made Miguel a lot of money, earning him a lot of credibility. But at the same time, he was talking about the cartels within that area. And that's something they didn't like. In the weeks leading up to his death, Miguel received a threatening call from a man who claimed to be a part of Los Zetas. Now, this member warned Miguel to shut down his media house or face the consequences. Miguel, unfazed by that threat, warned his family that the Zetas were after him, reminding him to be alert. But little did he know that they didn't want his family. He was their only target. October 9th, 2008. Minutes after dropping off two colleagues, Miguel Angel Villagomez Valle was intercepted by at least two cars with armed individuals who abducted him. He never got home that night, and his family called the cops, informing them about that threatening phone call. Around 10 a.m. the following day, police found his body at the side of a road near a dump, about a kilometer away from the exit to the town of La Union. His body was covered in bruises and had six gunshot wounds to the back and one to the head. The scene was so gory, one police officer cited Miguel was killed like a dog. Number 8. Eliseo Baron. Baron was another veteran Mexican reporter murdered for exposing El Chapo's criminal affairs. But in his case, Eliseo refused to go down without a fight. In 1973, he was born and raised in Durango, Mexico. After studying agricultural engineering in college, he would find himself reporting on crimes at the peak of Mexico's war on drugs. He began his career in journalism with the newspaper Zócalo in Acuña, Coahuila, where he worked for six months after graduating from college. Then he worked as a reporter and photographer for La Opinión in Durango for over 10 years. For context, Sinaloa, Durango, and Chihuahua form a golden triangle of drug trade in Mexico, and smaller cartels initially moved into the Durango and Torreon areas. However, in 2009, those areas were taken over by El Chapo Guzman, who was reported by Forbes at the time to be one of the most powerful drug cartel leaders in Mexico. In mid-April 2009, 
a few weeks before Baron's death. Reports came out saying El Chapo Guzman had made Durango his home, and Mexican authorities weren't doing anything about it. This pushed Eliseo to dive deeper into the case, and voila, he made a massive discovery shaking the foundations of the entire police force. May 2009, Eliseo reported about the involvement of hundreds of officers aiding the Sinaloa cartel and Los Zetas in the area, transporting tons and tons of cocaine without making any substantial arrests. Now, this report was so detailed that 302 police officers and at least 20 members of law enforcement agencies were fired. He single-handedly wiped out every corrupt cop in the area, making him an official enemy to many. 8 p.m., May 25th, 2009. Eight armed guys broke into Baron's home while he watched TV with his family. They beat the living daylight out of him while his family was forced to watch. And once they were done, they took him with them. Baron was missing for an entire day, with no one having any idea who those armed men were or where they had taken him. But after 24 hours of searching, his body was found in a ditch nearby with a gunshot wound to his head, at which time he was pronounced dead. But what shocked everybody was the note found on his dead body, saying, This happened to me for giving information to soldiers and for writing too much. Banners placed around the city of Durango on the day of Baron's funeral at first indicated that Joaquin El Chapo Guzman of the Sinaloa cartel had taken responsibility for his death. However, Mexico's Secretariat for National Defense, Sedena, detained five random drug cartel members in Gomez Palacio and even announced that one of the men involved in the murder, Raul Lucifer Hernandez of Los Zetas, had ordered Baron's murder. And that really wouldn't come as a surprise, as we know Los Zetas can be extremely violent and ruthless. Known for their merciless tactics, including things and public displays of brutality, Los Zetas have been involved in a long-standing and deadly feud with the Sinaloa cartel. Now, this rivalry, fueled by territorial disputes and control over drug trafficking routes, has led to a relentless cycle of bloodshed. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, you'll know in a minute. But, three out of five alleged members of Los Zetas who were detained admitted to having participated in Baron's murder. They were eventually prosecuted and each handed their sentences. But here's the catch. Rumors circulated by other journalists working with Baron suggested that El Chapo did in fact order his assassination, but used his connections to pin it on the Zetas in a bid to liberate his organization. The two syndicates hate each other. So, maybe, just maybe, there's some level of truth to that rumor. Number 7. Jose Luis Romero Take this from me. Luis is arguably the bravest journalist Mexico has ever had. He stepped into the belly of the beast, Sinaloa, uncovering the deeds of El Chapo. However, like others, he paid with his life. It all started when Romero took up a job as a radio journalist for Mexican radio station Linea Directa. He was best known for his reports on the Mexican drug war and the trafficking. The only problem was he was doing this in one of the states hardest hit by the Mexican drug war, Sinaloa. The state of Sinaloa is home to the infamous Sinaloa Cartel, one of the most powerful and notorious drug trafficking organizations in the world. They pose a significant threat to both the security and socio-economic fabric of the region it operates in. Led by incarcerated drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman and the very elusive Ismael El Mayo Zambada, the cartel is a formidable force in the global drug trade. Its operations have contributed to a surge in violence as rival cartels vie for control over lucrative drug routes and territories. The violence extends beyond the cartels themselves, affecting local communities and residents who find themselves caught in the crossfire. At the peak of Mexico's war on drugs, the Sinaloa cartel didn't take as much damage as the other ones due to El Chapo's secret connections with the authorities. At the same time, he would wipe out journalists who dared to report against his operations. A total of 17 reporters fell prey to his bizarre level of ruthlessness, and the next man on that list was about to be Luis Romero. December 30th, 2009. 
Luis was outside a seafood restaurant at the intersection of Alvaro Obregón and Doroteo Arango in the Jiquilpa neighborhood. For context, the veteran journalist went on vacation a week prior and was supposed to return to work on his news program in January 2010. However, he never lived to see that day, as four hooded men with rifles took him captive. Adding to this, they stole his vehicle and left no traces that could be led to his discovery. After his disappearance, a vigil took place outside the Attorney General's office in Los Mochis, Sinaloa. Reporters came together asking authorities to respond to the abduction at a faster pace. But even more troubling was the fact that hours after the state ministerial police's chief investigator, Jesus Escalante Leva, began making his initial inquiries into Romero's disappearance, he was brutally shot and killed outside of his office. No one knows who did it, how they did it, or even why they did it. But it kind of looks like the Sinaloa cartel had a hand in it. January 16, 2010. Jose's decomposing body was discovered alongside a highway outside of Los Mochis. His corpse had signs of being beaten and tortured. His legs and hands had been broken, and he'd been shot three times and then wrapped in a plastic bag. The discovery of Romero's body was marked as the 59th journalist killed in Mexico since 2000. It was like journalism was the new death penalty. There was a 90% chance of getting killed. This prompted Mexican senators to propose a new law stating that journalists attacked would be guaranteed free medical care. Plus, they could, along with their families, request protection from authorities and give the right to protect the confidentiality of their sources. This was definitely one step in the right direction, but nothing has really changed. Number 6. Miroslava Brish Veldusea 7.06 a.m., March 23, 2017. Mexican journalist Miroslava was shot eight times as she drove her son to school. Her death enraged thousands of people she had liberated with her work, but it came as a consequence of her audacious moves against the high and mighty drug lords in Mexico. Born on August 7, 1962, Valducea grew up in the Sierra Tarahumara region of the Mexican state of Chihuahua, living with her siblings and single mother. She never got to meet her father as he died when she was an infant. His death was part of the thousands of casualties from Mexico's war against drugs, but at the same time it was fuel to the fire burning inside her to bring an end to the discreet operations of these deadly cartels. In 1987, after getting a degree from the Autonomous University of Baja California, Sur, she began working in journalism with two local newspapers in Los Cabos. However, working with these media houses made her discover the real problem Mexico had at the time. And it was the fact that many journalists turned their backs on the truth in fear of getting killed by those so-called high and mighty. Nevertheless, someone had to expose them. Someone had to damn the consequences and stick their nose right in their dreaded rabbit hole, sniffing out all of their secrets. Belducea got the wake-up call and decided something had to be done, but the consequences were grave. March 4, 2016. La Ornada, one of the media houses she was affiliated with, published an article of hers exposing details of cartel members infiltrating the mayoral candidate lists for the Institutional Revolutionary and National Action Parties in rural mountainous drug corridors of Chihuahua. This placed a direct target on her back, and the newspaper wanted nothing to do with her anymore, so she was fired. In turn, she created her own news agency, MIR News. Here she would talk about human rights violations, female homicides in Ciudad Juarez, the murder of famous social activist Maricela Escobedo Ortiz, disappearances, and all the drug trafficking in Chihuahua. As if that wasn't enough, she dug deeper into the crime world, exposing the former governor of Chihuahua, Cesar Duarte Juarez, claiming Duarte operated a private network of friends and family embezzling 900 million pesos in his six-year tenure. That's roughly around $50 million. That's a lot of money. But one of her most important exposures was that of the Mexican Attorney General's investigation into the existence of clandestine graves being used in El Largo Maderal. This investigation also revealed 
at Sergio Almaraz Ortiz, Secretary of Public Safety in Ciudad Juarez, had failed the security test from the National Public Security System, and as such, her investigation led to his removal. At this point, she had bitten off more than she could chew. She had dozens of death threats from cartels operating in the area, and from some corrupt officials warning her to back off. But her dedication to her craft was so intense, she was ready to lay her life on the line to get justice for the people who deserved it. March 23, 2017, after she was found shot dead in her Renault Duster SUV en route to her son's school, a note was found resting on her bloodied body. It was from the killer, L80, renowned leader of the Juarez Cartel's paramilitary wing, La Linea. It read, For being a snitch, L80. L80 was identified as Carlos Arturo Quintana, son of Cesar Raul Gamboa Sosa, who had been killed three days before Miroslava's murder. Gamboa Sosa was also the leader of the crime syndicate La Linea, a division of the Juarez Cartel. But how did any of this relate to her? Well, according to investigations, the motive for her murder was likely revenge for exposing a mayoral candidate, Juan Miguel Salazar's alleged connections to the Sinaloa cartel, causing him to lose that election. But now what's even more disturbing was the fact that she was seeking protection for her and her children from the government. However, she was denied access to any security. Yet after her death, the governor of Chihuahua, Javier Corral Urado, said that she never was seeking aid from his security forces, despite overwhelming evidence that stated otherwise. So could her death have been a result of her daring publications against the Juarez cartel? Or was it a carefully curated plan to assassinate her for opposing the government? I guess we'll never know. Number 5. Vladimir Antuna the death of Vladimir Antuna was particularly disturbing not because he was a journalist, but because he wasn't a threat to anybody. In 1990, he became a crime reporter and editor at El Tiempo de Durango. While working there, he would collaborate with fellow journalist Eliseo Baron Hernandez, also a writer and editor at La Opinión de Torreón in Torreón, Mexico. Both investigated police brutality and corruption in Durango. And keep in mind that this investigation was one of his biggest in the state of Durango at the time, but sadly, it led to Antuna's death. During the course of his investigation, he received many death threats, some which came from members of the Zetas cartel. To put into context why he was a target, the Mexican government initiated a drug war against the trafficking in Mexico. That was in response to devastating crimes by the cartels that were dangerous enough for the U.S. authorities to advise U.S. citizens to avoid traveling to some parts of Mexico. Durango specifically became violent due to Los Zetas, which competed for territory over their rival Sinaloa cartel. The Sinaloa cartel had their hands in it first, claiming the rights to narcotic distribution routes. That was the catalyst for their deadly clash. And while that was going on, journalists in Durango claimed to be threatened by these drug cartels and the government doing the bare minimum to interfere. Both cartels used publicity contracts and instructed owners of media companies not to publicize negative stories about them. Yet Vladimir continued his publications about their operations and the hundreds of casualties involved. April 29, 2009, a gunman opened fire on Antuna as he was leaving his house. He would escape uninjured from that incident, but that attack set the stage for some real drama to unfold. Later that evening, he got a call from an anonymous mystery man who said these words before hanging up. We found your home. It's over for you now. A frightened Vladimir immediately went to the authorities to report the attack. They did assign him a bodyguard, but the attorney general had also made a note in his file saying he was paranoid his friend said that he was aware of the danger and had confided in him, saying that he wasn't afraid to die, even though he was really terrified of dying. Another journalist working at El Tiempo de Durango, Carlos Ortega Samper, was killed. Three weeks later, a second journalist, Eliseo Baron, was beaten and killed. And a week later, Vladimir Antuna was threatened again. In such a situation, any sane person would have taken the next flight straight out of Mexico. 
but not on Thuna. Yeah, he was scared for his life, and of course that of his family, but he somehow found a way to pull himself together while trying to investigate the death of his partners. Unfortunately, before he could make any headway, he joined him in the afterlife. November 2nd, 2009, Antuna was abducted while he was on his way to work. Witnesses said two SUVs diverted his Ford Explorer while driving on Normal Avenue, a main street in Durango. Subsequently, four men with assault rifles would step out of that white truck and Chevy SUV to surround Antuna's car. The men then pulled him into one of their vehicles before driving off. Around 9 p.m. that same day, his body was found near the site where he was abducted. His corpse would show signs of strangulation and bruises, with many bullet wounds to the head and abdomen, and in typical fashion, a message was found on the body saying, This happened to me because I gave information to the military and wrote things that I shouldn't have written. Be careful when preparing stories. Sincerely, Vladimir. It was a disheartening end to such a prolific journalist, and sadly, his death could never be avenged. No arrests were made, and the cops failed to identify any motive, except for the fact that he was a journalist. Even worse, no one condemned the act, not the governor, not the head of the federal police, nobody. The day after his murder, 40 journalists petitioned to condemn the crime. They took it as a warning, meant to intimidate journalists in Durango. It made the special prosecutor for the assault on journalists, aka the PGJE, to take over that investigation. However, it yielded absolutely no results. And just like the 13 others killed that same year, Vladimir Antuna's death remains an unsolved case. Number 4. Annabel Hernandez One of the most powerful men in the government want to kill me because I reveal in my book that he was in the payroll of the Sinaloa cartel. In 2010, Annabel found herself on the hit lists of various powerful entities. The Sinaloa cartel, the Mexican government, and a faction of the US government. The cause? A book she authored, meticulously exposing their intricate dealings. Consequently, she became a fugitive in Mexico, compelled to flee the country with her family. However, this was never the life she envisioned for herself. Born in 1971, Annabelle dreamt of being a lawyer as a child. However, that dream wouldn't come to fruition after she noticed the bias in reports from journalists and media houses on the drug war. A good number of people were murdered daily across the country, but far less was being reported. Reporters and journalists would shy from these types of stories in fear of getting killed, but not Annabelle. At just 21, she launched her own newspaper, Reforma, while still attending college. Her inaugural front-page story about exposing electoral fraud in Mexico City garnered significant attention, but this was the first of many to come. Three years later, as her work continued to draw notice, Annabelle, pregnant with her first child, found herself under the watchful eye of the Mexican government. She would keep changing jobs, allegedly because the Mexican government was out to censor her work. However, just as we would expect, this didn't derail her. For what it's worth, it made her want to do more, expose more, but it landed her in a lot of trouble. December 5th, 2000, Annabelle received a distressing call from her mother, telling her that her father is still missing from the previous night. The search started with calls to local hospitals and a radio station. Upon locating his abandoned car, Annabelle's brother made a gruesome discovery. Her father's blood-stained shoes were in the trunk of his car, parked by the roadside, his body not in sight. By the evening, his lifeless body was found on a highway outside Mexico City. At this point, it became very clear that Mr. Hernandez was now a victim of the war between Annabelle and the entire narcotics underworld. The police said that they could help investigate this murder, only if the Hernandez family paid him to do so. It's almost dystopian. But despite this tragic loss, Annabelle, rather than retreating, sought vengeance. In 2001, while working with a major newspaper in Mexico, Annabelle exposed the extravagant use of public funds by the Mexican presidential candidate, Vicente Fox. This was despite his campaign promises of economic austerity. The newspaper showed expense reports from his government uncovering overcharges, unverified purchases, and connections to non-existent companies. 
The story gained international recognition, even earning Annabelle an award. But her quest to expose the truth and bring down the men who killed her father didn't stop there. In 2010, Annabelle released a book titled Los Señores del Narco, roughly translating to Narco Land, the Mexican drug lords and their godfathers. The book exposed in grave detail the relationship between the cartels, El Chapo, the Mexican government, and the United States. It took her five good years to make it, and it went into some deep details, probably the most detailed book any Mexican reporter had ever made. Annabelle asserted that Mexico's structures empowered the cartels, making drug trafficking feasible. Not like anyone ever doubted that. But she further claimed that under President Vicente Fox, the government's stance shifted, aligning with the Sinaloa cartel and allowing El Chapo to make his grand escape in 2001. Annabelle also alleged a secret deal between the DEA and drug traffickers for the importation of fentanyl and methamphetamine, asserting the agency profited billions from the trade. Annabelle was a one-woman army, ready to burn the entire narcotics underworld to the ground. Sadly, they fired back. She was facing death threats from the Mexican government, with Gennaro Garcia Luna, a corrupt official she exposed, indirectly making his plans to assassinate her known. And although she barely escaped, the fear of death prompted her departure from Mexico a few months later. Now she lives a low-key life outside Mexico, in fear that an associate of the people she exposed could end her life. And while she achieved her goal of exposing the truth, the corruption in Mexico still reigns supreme. I hope that my, my, my work can help to the people to understand what is happening. And if the people understand what is happening, the people can change the things. Number 3. Jeanette Bedoya Lima But in 2000, she got too close to uncovering an arms smuggling ring. She was kidnapped, driven two hours out of Bogota, ripped, bound, and thrown into a garbage dump. That was Jeanette receiving an award for her bravery as an investigative journalist in Colombia. Now that's just one side of her story. The other entails her getting kidnapped, heaped and tortured not once, but twice. In 2000, the first time this happened was when 26-year-old Lima worked alongside Ignacio Gomez, another investigative journalist at the Bogota Daily Newspaper. Lima at the time was covering a very crucial story on the Colombian war against terrorism. While investigating a story on arms trafficking by both state officials and the paramilitary group called the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia. As part of covering her story, she received an invitation from a convicted killer simply known as The Baker. He wanted to meet up with her and give her all the information she needed at the infamous La Modelo prison near Bogota. She entered with an editor and photographer, but when they arrived, things got hazy. Both the photographer and the editor mindlessly stepped out for a few minutes while they awaited clearance from prison wardens to enter the facility. By the time they got back, Lima was gone. No screams were heard, no signs of struggle, and certainly no eyewitnesses willing to speak. Lima later revealed that she was approached by a man with a scar over one eye, who wore shiny shoes, and who also shoved a gun below her waist. He took her out of that prison through another exit, while the wardens watched remorselessly. Then an unidentified group of men would beat her to a pulp, violating her sexually, while repeating the words, Pay attention, we're sending a message to the press in Colombia. When they were done, they threw her semi-conscious body into a pile of dump beside the road. By evening that day, she was discovered by a taxi driver, who immediately drove her to the hospital. Lima barely survived this attack, and rather than running away or quitting, she stuck with it. Like the words of Van Gogh, she'd put her heart and soul into her work and had lost her mind in the process. She didn't quit. Instead, she went harder on her quest to uncover the truth. Sadly, it led to her second kidnapping, and this time, they went harder on her. In 2001, a year after the incident, Lima was hired by El Tiempo, a Colombian newspaper, and was put in charge of its law enforcement coverage, including reporting on the war between the FARC guerrillas, the paramilitary groups, the armed forces, and the Colombian government. Before this, though, she had received international recognition in the U.S. for her unwavering commitment to her job. That recognition also played a positive role in her career, 
It would protect her from more violence. She had received a telegram once from a boss from the paramilitary forces saying that she had nothing to fear from them. The FARC guerrilla chiefs gave her similar assurances, but it was simply bait to lure her into another trap. August 2003, she traveled to the town of Puerto Alvira to report on how it had been taken and held by the FARC guerrillas for more than a year, forcing its 1,100 inhabitants into full-time cocaine production. When they arrived, the guerrilla leader instructed their kidnapping and took away their cameras, cell phones, and clothes. The leader had also ordered his people not to speak or feed them. However, they defied those rules. They not only gave them food, but also try to help him after they heard their leader was planning to kill him. Once again, Lima would cheat the hands of death after a senior FARC commander, after his senior FARC commander was alerted to the situation. He immediately ordered her release and apologized on behalf of the leader who ordered that kidnapping in the first place. Lima had become a household name in Colombia and messing with her wouldn't have just been a national issue but an issue that would have definitely brought questions from international organizations. This is partly the reason why Lima is still alive today. Aside from the fact that the drug trafficking scene in Colombia is slowly deteriorating, Lima has claimed so many awards and international recognition for her job that she's regarded as the face of journalism in Colombia. But this next journalist on the countdown is regarded as her Mexican counterpart. Number 2 Enrique Quintanilla August 9, 2006 The bruised and lifeless body of Enrique Parea Quintanilla was found outside the city of Chihuahua with two gunshots to his head and back. This was his punishment for messing with the infamous Juarez cartel. But they weren't the only ones after him. A faction of the Mexican government also wanted him dead. And you won't believe the cruel reason why. Quintanilla's journey to becoming both wanted by the Juarez cartel and Mexican government began when he started his own investigative magazine called Dos Caras Una Verdad, which translates to Two Sides One Truth. He founded his magazine in 2005 after working 20 years as a crime reporter and investigative journalist. His aim was to unravel the men behind the countless homicides and drugs trafficked in Chihuahua. And you really have to commend his boldness, because Chihuahua at that time was one of the worst places to be in Mexico. It was governed by Mexican state officials, but the Juarez cartel had the final say on all affairs. The cartel was responsible for transporting billions of dollars worth of illegal drug shipments into the U.S. At the same time, they were in a territorial battle with the Sinaloa cartel. This led to countless homicides within and outside the city. Now, Chihuahua was also the home to some of the most corrupt Mexican cops and officials. I mean, they have to be. How else would you get tons of cocaine shipped across the border without getting stopped? The cartel streamlines millions into their pockets so they can keep their mouths shut. And whoever dared to step in their way was six feet under within the next 24 hours. Chihuahua was a modern-day Gotham City, and Quintanilla took up the role of Batman, trying to keep the city clean. However, in this one, Batman dies. Now, before this happened, Quintanilla used his magazine to fight for justice. It was strictly crime-related, and it was known for criticizing the Mexican government for the high homicide rates in the state of Chihuahua, particularly the executions between rival drug cartels. He also talked about corrupt officials, unsolved murders, and drug trafficking activities. The implication of this was that he was harassed on multiple occasions. However, a few days before he was murdered, he exposed photos and documents giving sufficient detail, exposing government officials involved in the drug trade. It even implicated the then governor of Chihuahua, Jose Reyes Paez Terrazas. This was the trigger that provoked Quintanilla's death. August 8, 2006, Quintanilla was last seen leaving his office around 11 a.m. However, he wouldn't get home that night. His family reported him missing the next day, and his body was found by authorities dumped along the roadside. The crime displayed harrowing evidence of torture, marred by wounds from a 45 caliber pistol to the head and back. Police noted a chilling resemblance to his brutal demise and the execution style favored by the Juarez cartel. But that theory was debunked a few years later. October 12, 2012, Mexican Media House, TV Azteca received a video from an anonymous user showing two naked men with clear signs of having undergone torture, confessing their involvement in the assassination of Pereira Quintanilla. 
the alleged killers, Leopoldo Rodriguez Garcia and Armando Duarte Escobedo, were interrogated by an unseen man heard in the background of that clip, and they both had admitted that they had killed Quintanilla on orders of three drug lords of the Juarez cartel. A few weeks later, another video was posted on the Mexican news website, El Diario de Chihuahua. In this video, the brother of the Chihuahua State Attorney General, Mario Angel Gonzalez, was seen handcuffed and surrounded by at least five masked gunmen carrying assault rifles. After answering some questions, the man confessed that his sister, Patricia Gonzalez, the State Attorney General, had ordered the execution of Perea Quintanilla and Armando Rodriguez Carreon, another journalist. Many people saw this as the cartel forcing the real killers to confess to their crimes. They tried pinning his death on the cartel, but they in turn produced the real killers. The only problem was, they did that six years after his death, and also after a set of gunmen killed one of his sons, Jonathan Perea Cárdenas, in 2009. And number one, Annabel Flores Salazar. They say not all heroes wear capes, and while the works of Annabel made her more than just a hero, she did face a cruel death that you wouldn't even wish on your worst enemies. In the 80s, Flores worked as a freelance reporter for the newspaper El Sol de Orizaba. She'd worked as a reporter for at least six years prior and had also reported for other news outlets, such as El Mundo de Orizaba and El Buen Tono. But here's where her story gets interesting. Annabelle bought a pretty expensive car during her time as a journalist, the type of car that would cost the annual salary of an average Mexican journalist. Her bosses began questioning her extravagant lifestyle and even began speculating that she was working secretly with the cartels, hence her source of funds. And there are two specific reasons why they thought so. One was because of her association with a cartel sicario named Victor Osorio Santa Cruz, alias El Pantera. Annabelle was caught in the company of El Pantera the exact moment he was arrested. Even though she claimed to have just been having a random conversation with him, some say she was more or less like his partner. However, if Flores did truly know El Pantera, it didn't make her any more suspect than many journalists who know and sometimes socialize with criminals. And a nice SUV doesn't make her a crook. Secondly, she investigated local crimes, like vehicle accidents and police duties. In addition, she would often write about murders, finding a connection with underage victims and the drug cartels operating in the area. But she never seemed to say anything negative about these cartel members. So, could she have been paid off? Well, maybe. Her bosses were thinking it. What they didn't realize was that Flores never wrote negatively about these cartels because she didn't want the young victims in her writings to become targets. It was a way of her playing things safe while bringing awareness to the public on concerning matters. That's why we believe she was a hero. But her heroism eventually led to her death. February 8th, 2016. As Annabelle was feeding her 15-day-old baby, eight masked gunmen in black military uniforms stormed into her home in Veracruz, Mexico. They pretended to be authority on a lawful mission, shouting that they had a warrant and ordered her to get down on the floor. They immediately dragged her out of her home and into their vehicle before driving off. Her family went to the police later that day, but nothing came of it. After 24 hours, her family was notified that the body of a woman matching her description had been found dumped by the side of a road. Reporters dutifully noted, just as she would have, that the victim had a blue plastic bag over her head, her hands were tied behind her back, and her pants were pulled down to her ankles. The cause of death was ruled to be suffocation, while her corpse did show signs of torture and sodomy. She became one of many journalists murdered in Veracruz. And if that name rings a bell, it's because this state is an exceedingly dangerous area for journalists to live in Mexico. There have been six murders, seven ongoing investigations of murder, and three missing person reports in the state since 2011. Even more disturbing is the fact that on the day her body was found, two other lifeless bodies were uncovered on a property. Now these bodies were connected to a crime that Salazar had been investigating before she was murdered. While a newspaper that she had previously worked for, El Buen Tono, was being threatened with arson by alleged members of the drug cartel Los Zetas. And just like Flores Salazar, 
These 10 journalists put their lives on the line despite knowing the risks involved. Of course, they experienced moments of fear, moments of weakness, and moments of doubt, but their courage and resilience stood out. Celebrating them isn't just acknowledging risk, it's applauding their defiance of the odds stacked against them. Si quieres ser periodista y no tener problemas, no puedes tú ser periodista, debes ser chayotero. Debes de venderte al mejor postor y simplemente publicar lo que él quiera en tu medio y nunca exhibir la verdad. 